This VizCast looks at the time-dependent behaviour of an inductor in a circuit with a switch. Pause the video and read through the question carefully. Now that you've read through the question, let's begin our solution with an interpret stage, which in this case is quite straightforward. We're basically trying to understand the time dependence of currents and possibly voltages in a circuit that contains an inductor. So for our develop stage, we might recall that we know the resistance in this particular circuit is constant. The resistance doesn't vary with time. It's simply a physical property of whatever device that resistor might be. But we do know that the inductor, which is typically perhaps a coil of wire, as, as the circuit diagram tries to indicate, an inductor actually takes some time for any change in current to occur. The current can't change instantly because of the form of the inductor. It's, it's a coil typically that will make a magnetic flux through the coil as the current builds up and we know from Faraday's law that that will induce an EMF that will actually oppose the building up of that current. So we can think about the current versus time relationship. This is the current through our inductor as a function of time. When we first close the switch, um, the current actually can't establish itself. There's a very large uh, EMF produced by the inductor, so it only gradually increases and it approaches some final value in a function like that. And in a similar way, we could look at, as a function of time, the voltage across the inductor and we'd see that as soon as we close the switch and the current is trying to establish itself, that's a large change in magnetic flux that produces a large EMF. But then as the current slowly builds up, the rate of change of the flux reduces and our voltage actually decreases and approaches zero. So let's think about the two cases that we're investigating here. At t equals zero, if that's when we're thinking about closing the switch, um, that's when there's no current instantaneously flowing through the inductor, but there's a large voltage across the inductor. That means if there's no current flowing down here, just as the switch is closed, then any current that's going through R1 here, for example, must also be going around through R2, because there's no current flowing through the inductor. This means that our circuit can essentially be modelled as our voltage supply with a resistor and a second resistor simply in series because there is no current going through that inductor. Essentially, as soon as the switch is closed, this branch of the circuit containing the inductor acts like an open part of the circuit immediately after the switch is closed. And so if I've got some applied voltage here, I could think about if this was R1 and R2, uh, I simply really have two resistors in series and I can analyze what the voltage through the 100 ohm resistor might be for that particular situation. What about for the second one, when I'm allowing the time to become very large, some very long time after I've closed the switch. We can see now the current through the inductor will be out here somewhere. It will have essentially got to its steady state value. It took some time to increase, but a very long time after the switch is closed, it will be at some definite value. And the voltage across the inductor will have come down approaching zero. So essentially the voltage across this part of the circuit here will have gone to zero. And you can see that because this is a parallel branch with this second resistor here, the potential drop across this entire parallel section here must also be zero. The voltage drop across each parallel branch is the same. So the voltage drop across R2 must also be zero, meaning there's no current going through R2. All of the current in the circuit now that goes through R1 must be coming down here through the inductor. And of course, with no potential drop across the inductor, it's essentially behaving as a zero resistance path. Our inductor is essentially just a wire, which we idealize as a zero resistance conductor. So our circuit now looks even simpler than before. We have our R1 resistor, and our inductor is essentially just behaving like a wire now. So now we really only have R1 in the circuit, and although R2 is still attached to the circuit, there's no current going through it. There's no potential drop across that part of the circuit. 
So now let's move on to our evaluate step. This should be reasonably straightforward. For part A, we can see what we essentially have is a voltage divider. We have two resistors in series across a voltage source. And so if we think about the voltage across each of those, our voltage divider equation simply tells us that the voltage across one of those resistors will simply be that resistor value divided by the total resistance in the voltage divider multiplied by the applied voltage, which in this case here is the 100 ohms divided by 100 plus 200, which is 300 ohms, multiplied by our 15 volts. And we can see one third of 15 is 5 volts. So immediately after the switch is closed, there will be 5 volts across the 100 ohm resistor. For part B, it's actually, again, even easier. For part B, the voltage now across R1 here uh, must be the entire voltage of the circuit. If you like, we could think about the voltage here across this parallel part of the circuit, V parallel, and we know that V1 plus V parallel must equal 15 volts. But we've just seen there is no voltage across the inductor at very long times, so this is simply V1 plus 0 must equal 15, or the voltage across the 100 ohm resistor at a very long time is 15 volts. So let's do a quick assessment here. One that we could try would simply be to consider uh, for the first part of the problem here, we use the voltage divider equation, but can we understand if that actually makes sense, for example, using Ohm's law? Uh, for part A, the circuit that we had here, uh, basically we can figure out that the total resistance of that circuit, our inductor is essentially acting as a break in the circuit, so it's simply going to be 100 plus 200 or 300 ohms, and then we can find the current in the circuit, which Ohm's law says will be the voltage divided by the resistance. We've got 15 volts divided by 300 ohms, and then the voltage across that 100 ohm resistor will be the current times 100, which is 15 over 300 times 100, and once again we're basically finding one third of 15 which is 5 volts, which is what we calculated using our voltage divider equation. So we can be confident in that answer.